said, welcome to the Great Legal Mind series. Today, we are honored to have Attorney Carrie Peck presenting some important trusts and estates and legal um, elder law issues. Mr. Peck served as the past president for the Chicago Bar Association, National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, and is a board member for the Center for I get Disability and Elder Law. Impressive. He is also a frequent lecturer and speaker. Um, he's done radio, TV, CLEs, you name it, he's done it. He's really what I consider the master of trust and states and elder law issues in Illinois. And he's also our very own IMBLF trust and states guru for the IMBLF Chicago chapter. So now without further ado, I'm gonna turn the present presentation over to Mr. Peck. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Peck. Marcin, thank you very much for the kind introduction, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I see we've now made it an international crowd. Welcome. Nice to I'm see you. No see. Yeah, nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. I was in China the last saw you. I'll, I'll be joining you for a few, for maybe a half an hour. I have a call, but I wanted to see you live. Okay, live and in person. Here we go. Thanks for joining. Thanks for taking time. All right, so Lauren, let's uh, let's hit our slides and um, let's talk about uh, representation of uh, clients with diminished capacity. Really, the fundamental underlying concept here is that with the graying of America and the aging of the world, um, everybody, regardless of what area of practice, is seeing more and more older adults uh, come to them for legal services and or counseling. And uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what area of practice you're in, you are going to uh, engage uh, with folks that have some degree of cognitive impairment. And of course, that impairment comes from a variety of different uh, causes. It could be Alzheimer's disease, it could be uh, traumatic brain injury and things of that nature. The American Bar Association uh, has adopted Rule 1.14, and fundamentally today we're going to talk about how to avoid, you know, malpractice cases and attorney discipline when you represent clients uh, with diminished capacity. And Rule 1.14 is, in fact, the appropriate rule. Uh, and uh, and there are a number of comments to that rule, along with an ABA formal opinion, which we'll talk about as as we progress. So Lauren, let's take it away. So uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, these are a, a list of a variety of impairments. Um, certainly the pandemic has brought us a number of new impairments. Uh, COVID-19, which I think all of us believe initially, uh, at least by, by press reports and medical reports, attacks the lungs as a respiratory infection, uh, ultimately, in many cases, has a, a, an impact neurologically. Uh, and it has a long-term impact. People that are in the hospital uh, as a result of COVID-19, of course, are having uh, to, go, to go through occupational uh, therapy, rehab therapy to learn to walk. Uh, many of them are suffering cognitive impairments. Uh, I have a dear friend who uh, has COVID, had COVID-19. He uh, has continues to have lung problems. And quite recently, he's been out of the hospital. He, he got uh, stricken with COVID very early on. He came out of the hospital uh, probably in April. And uh, about two weeks ago, the COVID-19 attacked his uh, vocal cords. And so he's now undergoing speech uh, therapy basically to continue to learn back how to talk. And there are considerable reports of, of, of neurological problems leading to some form of what I'll call, for lack of a better term, COVID dementia. Um, but clearly the, the, the largest uh, category today of folks that suffer cognitive impairments are Alzheimer's disease uh, and uh, folks that suffer from various types of dementia. That dementia could be vascular dementia, which is from strokes, uh, or it could be a variety of other things like Parkinson's, 
which ultimately leads to a dementia. Uh, certainly, uh, a, a brain tumor might lead to some form of dementia, alcoholism, psychotic disorders, and traumatic brain injuries, which are often closed head uh, brain injuries that are the result of either accidents, car accidents, or sports related uh, scenarios. So these are pretty, uh, this is kind of a laundry list of common impairments that you're going to see and you probably have already seen in existing clients or future potential clients that come to you for legal services and you need to determine number one, are they competent to engage me? And number two, if it's a long-standing client, what am I gonna do as I observe the cognitive decline of my long-standing client? That is a real serious issue. Next slide. By the way, as I, I didn't say, uh, I'd like to do this very interactively. Please, if you have questions, let us know. You can either use a chat feature on the Zoom or uh, unmute yourself uh, and let us know you have a question, wave your hand. I can see some of you on the screen, but I'd like to do this inter interactively. Um, so let's talk our first hypothetical, a COVID-19 uh, hypothetical. The client is stricken with COVID-19, hospitalized for several months, not unusual now, on a ventilator, no advanced directives. Advanced directives is, you know, the fancy language for no powers of attorney for property, which is the management of assets, and no power of attorney for healthcare, which is certainly the management of this hospitalization, was executed prior to the hospitalization. So there's no planning whatsoever, and you were scheduled to close on the purchase of a new warehouse for your client's business. This is a longstanding corporate client. Uh, and uh, you, you've represented this entity or this individual for a long period of time. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? And how are you going to, to uh, provide a continuous top flight legal service uh, operation for a client that is now cognitively impaired? May not be able to talk, may not be able to communicate, and has no advanced planning. So this is the audience participation time. Can a guardian buy the warehouse? Do you file for guardianship? What do you do? Any ideas? Okay. So I think what we probably need to do is file for guardianship. I call guardianship a lifetime probate. Most people are, are most familiar with post-death probate, but a guardianship is a lifetime probate. And fundamentally, a guardianship is, does Carrie Peck need a third party decision maker to make decisions for him in the management of his assets and or the management of his health care? Carrie, yes. um, what is the relationship? You know, I think of the, uh, the guardianship and so these issues in relation to personal families, but when you've got business partners or um, who, who makes, who's capable of making that decision? Um, if, if the uh, CEO is, is out of commission, does it become the business or is it the, uh, the spouse? Well, I think that's a great question and, and it, it's probably resolved by who's your client. You know, at the end of the day, if you represent the CEO and there is, you know, somebody else that's a corporate officer, maybe they can complete the transaction. But what if it's a sole proprietorship uh, and the man's buying a, uh, a, a warehouse or it's a corporation and the man's buying the warehouse and he's the president and his wife is the secretary? Or, you know, in many instances, people serve dual capacities as officers. I think that, the, that um, you know, if in this typical scenario, Arnie, you're gonna have to have a family member or a corporate fiduciary appointed as guardian for this individual. We certainly would prefer family because they're, they're, they're uh, familiar with what uh, is going on, but some of the transactions and some of the uh, estates, meaning a lifetime estate, is too large for a family. Here in Cook County, for example, if, if an individual has assets in excess of a million dollars, the court prefers to bring in a bank 
to manage those assets. Mm. So uh, that's a tough spot because today a lot of people have a million dollars in assets, when you, particularly when you add in a house. Uh, and, and so I think that it depends on the corporate structure. Certainly the corporate officers, the board potentially uh, could get involved and perhaps complete the transaction. But if, if there is no uh, fallback in the corporate structure, then we're going to go to the family and we're going to have ask the court to uh, appoint a guardian. That guardianship will be determined in large measure based upon medical evidence, okay? This is a, 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 a combination of both law and medicine. And as you all know, law and medicine from time to time don't uh, engage uh, well. So the doctors are gonna ask you, does Carrie Peck or does Arnie Lutzker have decisional capacity? And the lawyers are gonna say, is Arnie Lutzker competent? And just those, those, that language in and of itself is going to pose some problems. So it depends on what the standards are. Most standards for guardianship, certainly here in Illinois, but uh, nationally, the standard in general is an individual is totally incapable of making either personal, which is medical, or financial uh, decisions. And those guardians come in two forms. They come in a guardian of the estate, which is the management of assets and a guardian of the person, which is management of health care. And you know what? Everybody needs to know, this is what you want to avoid. You want to do advanced planning. You want to do your powers of attorney. You want to have a revocable living trust with a successor trustee that takes over when you become disabled or you die. Because your business affairs and your personal affairs don't belong in the courtroom. It's a public proceeding, it's cumbersome. You need to ask court approval for virtually everything, to spend the money, to make decisions, to close the transaction on the warehouse. So lifetime probates, avoid them. Avoid them, plan, plan, and plan. But Carrie, uh, going back, let, let's, let's put it in the context of a law firm. Okay. So you, you got a law firm with uh, three or four partners, um, you know, there's this, the senior guy becomes, you know, is in the hospital with COVID and things have to be done. Um, and let's, let's assume that he's got the majority share. Does the spouse take precedence over the law partners if it's not, if, um, absent, absent some clarity on that? Or would a law partner take precedence? Well, I think the first place in the law firm we're going to turn to, uh, Arnie, is the operating agreement. But in your hypothetical, the, the individual who's in the hospital has the majority share. So at the end of the day, uh, if, uh, if, if he controls the majority, then you're going to have to have a third-party decision maker for them. Under the law, okay, in, in terms of preference, the family is going to come first. Hmm. So that could be, that, that's quite a travesty in the management of the law firm. You know, you want to you be able to pick your partners. You don't want the court to impose uh, the wife to be the majority uh, owner, so to speak, or the majority decision maker. And imagine the, the, the complexity at running the law firm with a court-appointed guardian in which the court needs to order the decisions made in the law firm because the disabled person controls the majority interest. And, and, and then, I mean, it, it gets further complicated because if the spouse is not a lawyer, right. then you have the unauthorized practice, you know, is there practice of law going on by, uh, by the, uh, that guardian versus, right. you know, the members? And depending on how severely, uh, you know, ill that individual is, maybe you're promptly put into a scenario where somebody suggests, well, it's time to, to buy out that majority uh, owner. Okay. Next slide, please, Lord. So, uh, you know, I think everybody uh, kind of has some perspective of what Alzheimer's disease is, 
Uh, it's really a, 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 you know, progressive disease of the brain. Uh, there is, once an individual is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, there's no turning back. It's just a constant, constant progressive downhill slide uh, of cognitive impairment. Uh, there is no necessarily uh, published track record on how long it takes, but there are various stages of the illness and, uh, and it takes in some instances people longer and in some instances people uh, a shorter period of time to literally demonstrate that they suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I wrote an article for the Alzheimer's Association uh, in which it was, the, the thesis basically was if you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease fairly early on, most people retain the mental capacity, the cognitive ability to do planning. But if they don't do it then, then they're probably not gonna be able uh, to do it uh, later. Al Alzheimer's, uh, you know, is really the most common form of dementia. There are a number of, of uh, uh, medications out there, Namenda, Exelon, uh, Aricep, that are prescribed for this illness. Uh, regrettably, uh, they don't do a whole lot. And uh, people, once they're, they're uh, diagnosed with it, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's a downward slant and you need to plan quickly and you need to make plans for the future very, very quick. Next slide. So uh, the Alzheimer's Association recently came out with their 2020, they call it every year, facts and figures. Uh, look at the numbers, they're staggering. Almost 6 million Americans have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. So ladies, watch out. Uh, some people think it's because women live longer. Uh, it doesn't necessarily pan out that way. Uh, women are afflicted with Alzheimer's on a disproportionately high number. Look at the projection of 2050, 14 million people are projected to uh, have Alzheimer's disease. So uh, this is an epidemic. Next slide, please. Uh, mild to moderate uh, Alzheimer's disease, the, uh, you know, the, the brain regions uh, impact and, uh, on uh, thinking, planning. Uh, today, you know, there, we've learned uh, from a number of years ago that we have what's called tau, T-A-U in our brain that causes plaques and tangles. Uh, it spreads to uh, the areas that affect our speech, our ability to speak. And ultimately, I, I think that many people don't know, Alzheimer's in its final stages becomes a physical malady. People for, uh, forget, literally, they, they don't remember how to swallow their food and they get uh, aspiration pneumonia, they get food in their lungs and they choke to death. It's just a horrible end. Next slide. So, we really need to distinguish when, when clients uh, come to us, again, whether it's a long-term client or it's a client that uh, is coming to us for the first time, uh, is this client incapacitated or is this client suffering from some form of diminished capacity? Do we have the ability, if it's a, an existing client, to communicate with non-client family members and how do we uh, you know, identify kind of the overview with this client? What are our ethical challenges in the representation of a client with diminished capacity? Next slide, please. Next slide. So, you know, again, more often than not, this is a, an issue that pops up in the legal community and in the medical community, sometimes simultaneously, and sometimes sequentially. So in the medical community, a competent person is deemed to be able to make their own uh, decisions. A patient is presumed to have, you may, you may recall I used earlier the term decisional capacity in the absence of any notice uh, to the contrary. And ultimately it's gonna be a medical decision. 
Uh, I, on a daily basis, call upon consultants and experts to assess our client's mental capacity. Does Jane Doe have the capacity to do a new estate plan? Does Jane Doe have the capacity to engage in the decisions that she has called upon us to assist her with in the legal world uh, that she wants to get something done? And those are tough, tough questions because if it thumbs down and the client doesn't have the capacity and they haven't done planning, then we're back into this lifetime probate setting where a guardianship judge is very, very influential in running the life of this person's uh, personal side and perhaps business side as well. Arnie, you're reaching for the... For the yeah, um, in, in terms of um, lawyer liability, I mean, you're making a determination about <clears throat> the ability for a client to continue uh, to exercise the decision-making uh, actions necessary that you as a lawyer are consulting with. In terms of um, uh, challenges that are made either contemporaneously with that and the exposure of the lawyer to either malpractice or other other kinds of challenges, what what is it that that the lawyers could be facing when they when they make this you know reasoned decision, but you know somebody else is second guessing them and saying it you you've guessed it wrong. Well, I think at the end of the day, you don't want to make that decision on your own. Okay, we all went to law school. None of us that I'm aware of, perhaps there are some in the audience, went to medical school. Okay. And if you're going to make that decision and you're going to take a step to implement the decision of a person who may be cognitively impaired, I would recommend 100% and every single time you do it to have a letter in your file from a physician who has personally assessed that individual's mental capacity. Good. And that could be the attending physician because that's really where you want to start. In general, attending physicians have longer relationships with their patients, or it could be an expert that you hire to evaluate your client, and you have a report in the file that says, you know, dear Luxor Law Firm, I have evaluated, uh, you know, Pierre, and I find him to be mentally capable to make the decisions that his wife won't let him make. Wouldn't the first thing you would do is to advise the person directly of your concerns? You've got a client in your office who's showing signs of deterioration. He's making decisions. And uh, wouldn't your first obligation be to him to tell him that you are uh, uh, concerned about uh, is the deterioration of his, of his memory, of his, of his uh, analysis capability before actually going to a physician? I agree with you that if it's a long-standing client, then you should sit down with that client and say, you know, Mr. Smith, uh, we've been together. I've been your attorney for five, 10 years. Uh, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, what I see as perhaps your memory slipping, uh, whatever, you know, your observations are. And I think that uh, to protect both you uh, and your decisions, uh, it would be imperative that you be assessed by uh, I use in more often than not, if I'd like to get the internist involved, but generally the family practitioner uh, does not want to get involved. And so as a result, we frequently go to board certified psychiatrists, sometimes geriatric psychiatrists, sometimes a forensic psychiatrist to sit down and evaluate uh, the testing. Um, but I agree with you, Pierre. If it's an existing client, you certainly have that obligation. And even if it's a new client, when we have new clients that come in that want to do planning, uh, and uh, for example, I have a, a number of, of people that are referred to me by, uh, by doctors in that, that arena who uh, are sending them to me in part to determine whether, uh, from a legal perspective, they have the, the capacity. I turn back to them and say, Doctor, this is your patient. 
write me a letter and tell me what you think relative to their ability. So, you know, at the end of the day, yes, start with an existing client. I think you have an obligation. But Arnie, I don't, I, uh, don't take any action without a letter from the doctor that ultimately is going to be held up, whether it's a, a malpractice case or whether it's a challenge and discipline for my license for taking inappropriate action. Well, Carrie, have there's... you ever had the wool pulled over your eyes with a client coming in who appears to be perfectly capable and you later find out was not? Um, honestly, Susan, I can't remember that happening, but I, but I certainly can tell you that some people that are stricken with dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or not, but more often Alzheimer's, they engage in what's called uh, persevication yeah. or confabulation. And they can respond to you appropriately on the surface. But when you start digging and slicing the onion thinner and thinner, uh, you'll, you'll get where you need to be. So you don't wanna make that decision based upon a short uh, initial consultation. You wanna base, make that decision based upon spending some time with, with an individual and you know, maybe consulting uh, if they bring in their family, you, know, you watch the family's uh, body, uh, body uh, language and facial features and you see a daughter rolling her eyes at what mom's saying, you kind of go, oh, well, what, what's, what's really going on here? But, um, what about the client that's in denial? And, and I, saying, I'm fine, I don't have a memory loss, I'm totally fine, I don't need to see a doctor. What do you do with those types of clients? I mean, you can't force and, him to and, and, and it happens, and it happens, and you have to decide if that's a client you wanna keep, or that's a client you don't want to keep. And that's, that's at that point a risk a risk benefit analysis. I, I can tell you that, that in my office, uh, I've turned away uh, clients that absolutely unequivocally refuse to be evaluated. Because my sense of it is, if I believe that there's a concern and, I, and they're not willing to be evaluated, then I know there's a concern, okay? I, I know there's a concern. And at the, at the end of the day, you are putting yourself, uh, your credibility, your reputation, your license, and I would suggest liability for engaging in this type of conduct. Carrie, I mean, um, part, of, part of what I'm hearing is almost like an assumption that you're, you're, deal, you're dealing with clients face to face, that you can observe things. Lots of our practice, you know, everything's on the phone. You know, even Zoom, we, I mean, we don't, we don't see people. We're talking with them, we're emailing, we're taking actions based on that. There's, it's, uh, it, I, I'd say, this is not the type of thing that's been uppermost in my mind because, you know, we, we don't have the ability to observe and sense things. Uh, um, so when you're dealing with that level, uh, and, and maybe people I've represented for, you know, decades, but, you know, we, it's always been at this at this remoteness. Um, is there any is there anything that would be um, that we'd be responsible for to taking these other actions? And I got a related question dealing with the privacy information when you start getting into uh, consulting with physicians and the like. Well, I, I think that's a a, a a very good question. I think that that uh, you obviously have more um, challenges in assessing someone's capacity if you don't see them. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't observe any of the, the declines in the cognitive abilities, you don't observe it, whether you observe, whether it's on the phone or whether it's an email. But, it, but when that cognitive impairment reaches a certain level, you're going to see it in emails you're going to see it or hear it on a telephone. So I think that, that uh, you know, they may not be physically in your office. And certainly today, uh, you know, with the COVID scenario, everybody's doing it by Zoom or by telephone or by email. But I think you'll have an opportunity to, to uh, assess that uh, depending on how significant the impairment is. You know, they're writing you an email with the, with the you know, 
referencing a, a transaction other than the one you're involved in or referencing the wrong month or the wrong year or can't remember uh, who their, their members of the board are, you're going to know that. Well, I, I, I mean, just as you, as you were saying that, we're, we're in the middle of uh, uh, litigation in New York where the plaintiff is crazy. I mean, we're, we're defending copyright infringement case. She's a, just a lunatic. And you know we're, we're we're and it's pro se, and we're trying to deal with you know uh, we can't call her crazy, right? We can't we can't say she's got dementia. She gets states wrong. She you know the, the, there are various things that as you as you're saying that are coming up. I mean I don't know if if that if if that can be interposed in any. See I would I wouldn't proposed to do it in, in the current case, but it just sort of, the way you're describing it, it, it struck me as something that I may be dealing with at this moment in, a, in an unexpected <laughs> manner. I don't think your federal judge is going to order that the plaintiff be uh, examined by a psychiatrist. Somebody else have a question? Okay, Laura, let's uh, head, head onward. I, I have a question, Carrie. Yes, ma'am. Um, When you talk to the family, aren't you hobbled by keeping your clients' uh, confidences? And aren't you very seriously hobbled on what you could even say to a judge in the family? Well, uh, under uh, Lauren, let's we're, we're I don't I, how late do you guys want to go? Because we started a little late, and and maybe we can just go directly to the to the rule. Arnie, what's what's your time frame? We, we we got a, a, at least another fifteen minutes to up to a half hour. I know Pierre's going to have to go, sh or, or may have to go shortly, but we we've got time. I've got all another right. fifteen minutes. Yeah. All right. So, Mark, let's um, Lauren, let's just go to the rule one point one four. I'm not, actually backtrack for a minute for the hypothetical, and then we'll apply it. Um. So your longtime client's families contacted your law firm regarding dad's unusual behavior. You prepared dad's estate plan, served as corporate counsel for his business, and recently probated his wife's estate. Your client's family reports dad suffering from dementia, has recently met a woman at church. The family reports they're romantically involved. Dad's currently spending large amounts of money on his new love interest, and his children are concerned. Dad just bought the girlfriend a new SUV and appears to be paying her son's tuition at a private school. What can you do for the family? Who's your client and who can you talk to about the situation? So this, uh, I think, Mark, kind of is a blend of, of your question here because you've been corporate counsel for dad's business and the family's now coming to you uh, with a problem or at least they've observed this problem. And, and I can tell you that, that in our practice, uh, we are seeing these kinds of scenarios on a stunningly regular basis. Places that we used to think were safe, uh, senior centers, churches, synagogues. I was involved, I got hired in a case in which a, a, uh, a retired professional lost his wife. Uh, he went to, had been a church goer, but he went to church on a regular basis, three, four weeks uh, on Sundays to uh, mourn her loss. And the fourth Sunday, he sat down in the church pew and sitting next to him was an attractive young woman, 30 years younger. And it was love at first sight of his wallet. And, uh, and, and we are seeing so many of those cases, it's beyond imagination. So let's talk about the application of the rule to these kinds of scenarios as it relates to Mark's question. So, um, and this rule, rule 1.14, when the client's ability to make decisions uh, is diminished, whether because of disability or another reason, initially, uh, and Pierre kind of hit on this, you should maintain the normal lawyer-client relationship to the best of your ability. Go forward, please, Lauren. Uh, and 
thereafter, when the lawyer believes that the client has, has diminished capacity and may be at risk of physical, uh, financial, or other harm unless action is taken and uh, cannot adequately act the client's own interest, the lawyer may take necessary protective action, including consulting with individuals or entities that have the ability to take action and protect the client and potentially appoint, uh, seek the appointment of a guardian. Mark, you have a question or a comment? No, I, I, I'm listening. Go ahead. Okay. Go then to the next paragraph, please, Laura. So information to the representation, this is where we talk about the confidentiality and the interplay between 1.6 and confidential information and 1.14 and uh, the representation of a client with diminished capacity. So the information relating to the representation of a client with diminished capacity is protected. But when you take protective action, you are authorized under 1.6 to reveal the information about the client, but only to the extent the client's uh, necessary to protect the client's interest. So I can go to a doctor, I can actually go to the family and have a conversation without violating my client obligation of confidentiality if I believe this client is diminished capacity and is at risk. Again, physically, uh, financially, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, so these are the, the kind of the factors that we would consider uh, in conjunction with a determination as we balance those interests. And this is in the comment to that rule, the client's ability to, to articulate reasoning leading to the decision, substantive fairness of the decision, uh, the, the known long-term commitments and values of the clients, and the variability of the state of mind and the ability to appreciate the consequences of a decision, okay? Uh, I was involved in a guardianship case. The, the issue was, should we take off the leg, the gangrenous leg of uh, this veteran? And he testified in front of the judge that he understood his death would be horrible. His, the end of his life would be, uh, you know, absolutely the worst it could possibly be if he didn't undergo the amputation. And uh, when I asked the judge to unwrap the, the, uh, the, the taping, she said, no, we're not doing that in my courtroom because unfortunately gangrenous limbs have both an odor and uh, are, are horrible to look at. But she concluded that this man understood the consequences of his decision and allowed him to live with the gangrenous leg, but he didn't live very long. Next slide. So, you know, what does the obligation imply under these rules? Again, we have to try and, and, and treat a normal client relationship. We have to uh, attempt to communicate and we continue as far as reasonably possible, reasonably possible to take steps based on the client's decision. Next slide, please. So how do we communicate with uh, non-client family members? This goes way back to Mark's question and to our hypothetical, okay? If dad's my corporate client for a long period of time and the family comes in and says, hey, we're worried, dad uh, seems to be cognitively impaired, he now has a new uh, girlfriend, he's spending massive sums of money, and, uh, and where are we going? So Pierre, you asked, your obligation, keep the client informed. Next slide, please. Can you involve family members to assist in the representation of a client with diminished capacity if it's necessary? The answer clearly is yes. And the comment to this rule indicates you can do so. If the client wishes to have family members present, then it doesn't affect the attorney-client uh, uh, privilege. But the lawyer must keep the client's interest foremost, except for protective action under 1.14, must look to the client and not the family members to make decisions. So more often than not, this is going to lead to one mental uh, status evaluation by a physician. Uh, you know, 
not the, not necessarily the administration of the uh, Montreal Cognitive Assessment that uh, the current occupant uh, of the White House indicates he passed, but uh, an evaluation, a sit down, a one on one, uh, you know, doctor patient analysis in terms of can my client make these decisions? Do I need to take basically? Do I need to use the nuclear option? And that is, do I need to file for guardianship over my own client? Do I have the, uh, the basis to take an adverse position to protect my client from himself? That's a pretty you know, heavy, heavy uh, burden and a difficult decision to reach. Next slide, please. So uh, can you seek outside help? Yes. You can consult diagnosticians, uh, and particularly um, when the disclosure of the client's condition to quarter opposing parties could have adverse consequences for your client. We talked about the, the interaction with one fix, uh, and careful to limit disclosure of your information uh, pertinent to the assessment of the capacity uh, when you seek the appropriate action. Maybe you're not going to file for guardianship. Maybe you're going to have your client assess to determine if he or she has the capacity to execute a power of attorney. And maybe that in and of itself will solve your problem. You have a client who's slightly cognitively impaired. He or she will execute a power of attorney to his wife, his, his her husband, uh, to somebody else, maybe to a bank to, to handle the financial side of either the warehouse purchase or the buyout in the law firm or you know potentially uh, involvement in the management of the law firm. But Arnie raises the good point, how do we deal with non-lawyer uh, individuals who are now all of a sudden in a position to potentially be in the management? So you don't wanna invoke this again, what I call the nuclear option uh, of guardianship, certainly if you can avoid it. Your middle ground there is, can this individual, does this individual have the cognitive ability to appoint an agent to make decisions for them uh, in these difficult circumstances? And you're not making that decision on your own, you're calling in an expert. You're calling in an expert who says, I evaluated Susan Lutzker and she has the ability to name someone else to make her decisions in the realm of the management of her property slash assets. Yes, sir. It, uh, Carrie, um, th this goes back to the other point I, I kind of raised that, that first thing, to consult with the physician. What's the relationship of that consultation with HIPAA or other privacy issues associated with, with people and dealing with doctors and you're, you're outside if there's no sort of clear directive? I mean, how, how do you navigate that? <coughs> well, as you know, HIPAA is uh, a pretty um, significant obstacle to the disclosure of medical uh, protected information. Uh, the way I deal with it, Arnie, is I engage the doctor so that that doctor is now my expert and I have control of the dissemination of that information. And, and I think that that's the only way uh, you can do that. But if the doctor is not, if, if the doctor you've engaged is not the physician of the client, then um, in other words, is the assumption is the physician has a long time relationship and can evaluate and, and sort of provide information you're bringing in are you saying you're bringing in a new doctor that would not necessarily have been the, the, the private physician uh, with, with family history and personal history of the, the That's client? That's correct. I would prefer to bring in a consulting physician that becomes my expert on who I'm going to rely for their, for, for giving me direction as to what uh, how far I can go in terms of listening to my client's direction or uh, not listening to my client's direction. And again, does my client require the appointment of a third party decision maker or can my client appoint uh, on his or her own 
a, a third party decision maker under a power of attorney or, and, a, or a revocable living trust. And, and but it, is, is that activity with your physician, does it require the consent of the client to participate in that process? I think that if the client is capable of giving that consent, the answer is yes. Barry, I'm going to have and, to. And, and if the client, I'm sorry, go ahead, Mark. What did you um, say, Mark? Was somebody else saying? Okay, sorry. I thought Pierre was saying he has to leave. We're about to say that. I was going to say I have to leave. But thank you very much uh, for your for your uh, comments. I recently had a situation in a litigation matter where I was representing a trustee that was responsible for an estate's financial affairs in East and he was being uh, uh, sued in court uh, over the management of the affairs of the estate. And uh, the litigation lasted many years and we were approaching a trial and he was exhibiting signs of, let's call it impairment, memory loss. And I was faced with the dilemma because we were negotiating terms of settlement. And my dilemma was that if he agreed to terms of settlement, um, could the, the terms of settlement be later challenged when, if someone were to find out that his capacity was diminished at the time he entered into the contract? That was an issue. And then the other debate I was having is if we didn't settle, at what moment in time would I have to disclose to the court that I, because this person would testify and his credibility would be impaired as a result of his memory losses. So these are all issues that that did arise in a, in a litigation matter. Uh, thankfully, he, there, was, there was a group of trustees in this case, so that they were able to make the decisions on behalf of the group, the, the, the individual that was being sued was, there, was, there were co-trustees managing the financial affairs of the estate, so they were able to make the final decisions, but it was still difficult because he was the lead, let's call it the lead person so I just wanted to share that with you, but the, the, the American angle is very similar, very, very, very similar to the to the issues that we would face here in this jurisdiction. So thank you very much. Sorry I have to leave. Thanks for joining us and thanks for sharing your, your experiences. Okay, bye bye guys. Bye bye now. Bye bye, Pierre. I think, I think, I think have... Pierre's uh, comments, you know, are, are certainly indicative of the, the trust and estate litigation that, that we do every single day. Uh, and, and the capacity of the individual uh, is constantly under scrutiny. Mark, I'm sorry. Do the physicians you speak to uh, tend to suggest or feel that one reason why, for instance, in your practice, you're seeing so many of the cases you are is because um, physical health is being prolonged disproportionately longer than mental health and mental decline. In other words, are we seeing more of this because the doctors are keeping us physically healthy, but mentally we're declining at the old pace, at the old uh, rate? Actually, uh... I, I'm not sure that I can comment on the, on the physical mental health scenario. I think we're seeing more of it because uh, it basically more often than not involves greed uh, and revenge. And, uh, and, and typically the greed is, is, um, is from, uh, you know, either a caregiver or a quote unquote loving family member uh, and the revenge is more often than not in multiple marriage scenarios where the children of the first marriage are fighting with the, uh, the second wife over control of the estate. But you may be right that, that uh, physically our bodies are, are being kept healthier and our minds uh, continue to deteriorate at the, as you suggest, the older, older rate. Um, now, I, I think it's safe to say that uh, during this pandemic, um, you know, you may have seen today, Michelle Obama uh, came out and said she is suffering from what she called a low state of depression. 
Uh, and it, it seems to be a, a rather common reporting scenario where particularly now during this pandemic situation, uh, more and more people are, are depressed. Uh, I know that the mental health professionals that I know, their business has never been better. Their business is booming. They don't even have enough time in the day to see the potential new clients that uh, are banging on the doors uh, in light of the pandemic uh, scenario and of course, all the other major social changes that are, are, are afoot uh, in our country. Thanks. Uh, I will say, um, like Pierre, uh, a lot of the things you've said uh, apply to my practice, which of course has nothing in the world to do with the trust in estates. But these issues of people not thinking clearly and uh, making decisions when they're not rational and living longer and being, it seems, a little bit less stable seem to be coming up more and more in what I do. Yeah, I, 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 I think that, that uh, what we're seeing is, as I mentioned at the outset of uh, this, this uh, seminar, this really cuts across the uh, practice areas of, of everything uh, that the members of uh, the IMBLF uh, do on a daily basis. And I frankly think it's just going to continue to get worse uh, because more people are aging, living longer. And, uh, and again, as I just mentioned, it appears that the mental health of more people are being uh, negatively impacted by the events of, of our current uh, you know, situation. Kerry, I was also reminded, uh, like Mark and Pierre, I had a case, um, it was uh, a long-term client, um, uh, that was heading into a bankruptcy and it was really the children trying to um, sort of squeeze out certain assets from the company that were properly the company's they were trying to claim it was uh, an elder <coughs> uh, parent uh, and they were fighting back and forth and he had definitely diminished capacity during the course of this and it really was not it was evident but not um anything he, he, he was he was functioning without a, there wasn't a guardian but the kids were trying to take over i mean clearly it was a, it was a very interesting uh, sort of complicated situation um and you know your comments about the greed uh it wasn't a revenge situation it was clearly a greed situation uh and it was like the the family versus the company in essence, and, um, and controlling assets in bankruptcy. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's just a, a, a growing problem. And I think that, um, you know, perhaps through educational programming like this, we can all, you know, brainstorm and, and uh, you know, take action and, and, and learn how to basically uh, protect ourselves and our clients simultaneously. Um, how are we doing on time? What do you guys want to do here? I would probably just say for recording's sake to wrap up in the next few minutes, but there isn't a, there isn't necessarily a cap on time. Okay. Um, Lauren, where are we, where are we on uh, the, the uh, slides? Oops. We're definitely more than halfway. Why don't you flip through and let me see what, uh, we've got a couple minutes we'll talk. Go ahead. So here, here, take a, a quick look at the uh, kind of the the ABA. I think maybe this is a good place to end. The American Bar Association has issued a formal opinion, uh, and I think that this is something that you know you're not going to keep uh, uh, at your fingertips, but it's something you should be aware exists. And that is that you know if an attorney decides that the client is incompetent to handle uh, his or her affairs you uh, can take protective action on behalf of that client. Again, that protective action may be an assessment. It may be filing for guardianship. Uh, and you're supposed to take the least restrictive action, noting at the bottom here, the appointment of a guardian should not be uh, undertaken if there's a less drastic 
method of, of solving this problem. Very, very, very important. If you file for guardianship on a, on a client, do not nominate yourself as the guardian, okay? Just that's verboten, don't do it. Uh, pick a, a trusted uh, uh, perhaps agency, a bank, maybe another lawyer uh, that uh, you have confidence in, maybe a family member, but do not uh, nominate yourself. It will be viewed as a stunning conflict of interest and uh, you will be uh, reprimanded, if not worse, for engaging in that type of conduct. So, final questions before we sign off? Just one question. So, under this opinion, uh, an attorney can file a petition for appointment of a guardian, even if the client directs him not to do so. That's correct. But I've made sure, Mark, that you got a medical opinion that says he needs it. Okay. It's just, it sounds like the lawyers are the ones who are going on the thin ice. Well, I agree with you. But that's that, that, that's part of the uh, reason we're talking about all of this. I'm going to do it at a cell and rendered by a physician that you know is going to uh, withstand the scrutiny of, uh, of the court and a cross-examination by uh, somebody as capable as you, you know? Very, very important. You're putting your own credibility on the line, your license on the line. Uh, you may be filing a petition for an appointment of a guardian for me. <laughs> <laughs> Kerry, this was fabulous. This yeah. was really, really spectacular. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Uh, I, I agree you. completely, Kerry. And, and you know, so one of the, one of the things that's, um, that we've been able to accomplish is with uh, Annabelle flipping the record button, you know, we're going to be posting this online and uh, we've got a YouTube website. We've got a uh, online on the uh, uh, IMBLF website and we'll share it as much as you can. Any of the slides that you want um, to circulate, unless you want to keep them uh, sort of more controlled, but we can post them on the website as well. Um, and I'll, I'll add, uh, I'm going to be starting shortly um, a podcast approach to uh, complementing uh, this, this Great Minds legal series. And I want to do one-on-one -on -one audio, one-on-one -on -one with members about, it's, I'm calling it Law Stories. Uh, and I think you are a resident uh, expert of plenty of law stories uh, to share. So... But we'll, uh, the, the format will be different than the um, than this. It won't be a video. It'll be ideally 15, 20, 30 minutes, you know, in that in that range that could be useful for uh, audio listening. Uh, but you're going to be on my uh, on my go to list. Happy to do it. I appreciate the opportunity to present today. And, uh, you know, we're we're constantly being called upon to to to. Uh, to get involved in this arena with the media as well. Tomorrow I'm going to get interviewed by uh, Barons on the uh, abuse of powers of attorney. So that's another uh, angle. I just wanted to say, there it goes. You appear and you speak at all different types of venues and just another one. So we're going to call on you for sure for the podcast, right, Arnie? Absolutely. Um, this was a really informative um, presentation. I really learned a lot, and I think it touches upon all our practices at one capacity or another because, you know, our clients could have these issues at any moment, and what do you do? And so this is, was very, very useful and helpful information, Carrie. Thanks so much. Thank you, Marcine. Thanks. Nice to see you all. I uh, hope to see you in person someday soon. Hopefully. Hopefully. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day. Be safe, stay, stay healthy. Safe. Great. Right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, everybody.